you like our sign? If, you, if you've been here before, you know we open every show with that sign. Those are fluorescent light tubes. At home, in your electrical fixtures, you turn on the power, a strong electric field is generated. The gas molecules inside those tubes get excited when they drop back down to their lower energy state. The energy they give off causes the tube to fluoresce or give off light. <clears throat> Here, they're not hooked up to anything electrically. They're just tied onto a piece of wood. And we use the Tesla coil to generate that strong electric field. The field is so strong, it gets the air to break down and become a conductor. That's what those sparks are. That's what lightning is. So we made a little bit of lightning today. Ooh. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to the physics show. The community around Foothill College is so supportive of the college. We appreciate it very much. We're delighted we could put a show like this on for you. I'd like to start out by asking you a question. If this is your first time to a physics show, give yourselves a round of applause. All right, welcome. Welcome. And if you've been to one or more shows in the past, give yourselves a round of applause. OK, welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, so this is the physics show. That means I need to tell you what physics is all about, right? Physics, what is that? Well, when you're in school, you learn all kinds of great things. We kind of have a tendency to put things into categories, don't we? We've got our reading and writing and our history and our math, and one of those categories is science, right? Yeah, give it up for science, yeah. <laughs> and under science, there's so many great things, we put those into different categories, right? We've got our chemistry and our biology and our geology, and one of those categories under science is physics. And physics tries to explain the world we live in. Physics tries to explain the world we live in. Why is the sky blue? How does our refrigerator work? Why does the backpack slide off the seat next to you onto the floor when the car stops suddenly? Right? Electricity, magnetism, sound, light, all of these are topics under physics. And so today, we're just going to talk about a few of those. I like to say physics is a journey. And we're delighted you're coming along with us on that journey. Today, we're just talking about a few topics, some of Galileo's contributions to physics, and that includes inertia and the pendulum and, uh, and pressure. And so we're going to be talking about that today. And before we get started, I need to introduce some of the other presenters, my friend and colleague, Foothill Physics instructor, David Marasco. And we, uh, we love to show off our students. We have three student presenters today. Ann Clerken, Evan Perez, Laurel Wiley, and this is, this is kind of a special uh, show for us because Laurel and another student uh, running the camera, Sebastian, wave Sebastian, there. Their parents brought them to see the physics show when they were young, and now they're participating here as Foothill College students. So we, we love that. I'm Frank Coscarano, and you know what? You know what I always say? If you can't have fun with physics, you aren't a very fun person. So let's have some fun. Let's get started. We're going to start off uh, by talking about some of Galileo's contributions to physics. And Galileo, this all happened about 400 years ago. Galileo made lots of contributions to astronomy and math and engineering. We're not even touching on any of those today. We're just going to focus on some of his contributions to physics. And perhaps the biggest contribution is this idea of inertia. Before the, this idea, not much progress was made in physics because our foundation was wrong. I mean, you can't build on something when you have a weak foundation. And this idea really changed things. So uh, he got the idea, it said, when he was using ramps. And he released the ball from a ramp, and he's wondering how far up on the other side is it going to go before it momentarily stops and rolls back down. And he found that it went to about the same height where he released it from. And then he said, what happens if I bend that ramp down so it has a much longer distance to go? And it turns out it goes to up that much longer distance until it gets to about the same height that it was released from before it rolls back down. And then he said, I'm going to take that ramp and I'm going to bend it so it's flat. When's that ball going to come to rest? It's never going to come to rest. It's going to keep going forever. That is correct. That's the idea of inertia. 
So if something is at rest, it's not going to magically get up and start moving. It's going to stay at rest until a force acts on it and gets it to move. And if something is moving, it's not going to magically stop. It's going to keep moving until a force acts on it and changes its motion. And the first part of that maybe is a lot easier to understand, right? I've got a box sitting here on the stage. It's not going to get up and move unless I exert a force on it. So I'm going to exert a force on it, and it's going to start to move. Did it keep going forever? No. What must have happened to it? A force must have acted on it, right? And stopped it from moving. I heard a lot of people say it. Friction between the box and the floor. David, if, is there some way we can reduce friction and maybe get an idea, a better vision of inertia? We can use an air hockey puck, an air hockey puck. So this is floating on a cushion of air. So much less friction, and it goes and goes and goes. And you can kind of get an idea with this how that if you give something into motion, then we can get rid of some of these other forces. Like it's hard to get rid of friction, isn't it? But if we can make those much smaller, then we can kind of get an idea about inertia and how something would keep going. So let's do, uh, let's do this uh, little demonstration. Maybe you've done this yourself. I've got a ball and I've got a wagon. I'm going to make the wagon go that way. What's going to happen to my ball? Should we see? OK, here goes. What happened to the ball? Maybe this will help. The ball is right here. Okay? The ball is right here. Are you ready? So it did move forward a little bit, didn't it? It had no choice. The wagon was pushing it that way. It had to move that way a little bit. But it has inertia. It resisted that change, and it lagged way behind the wagon. It ended up at the back of the wagon, didn't it? So that's one way of thinking about inertia. It resists a change in motion. Now, how do we know the basketball has inertia? Because it has mass. It has weight. And that's how we measure inertia. The more mass, the more weight something has, the more inertia it has. So even you and I have inertia, but I probably have a little bit more than you do. Now let's get our wagon moving, and we'll stop it suddenly. What's going to happen to that basketball? What happened to it? It kept going, didn't it? Until it hit the front of the wagon and that stopped it. Now the same thing happens with us, with you and me, when we're in our cars. If the car stops suddenly, our bodies want to keep going forward. And we don't want the windshield to be the thing that stops us, do we? That would be bad. So what do we do? Seat belts, right? We put on a seat belt. And then when the wagon stops, the basketball is held in nice and safely by that seat belt. So please always wear your seat belt. Now our wagon is made of stuff, right? It has mass, it has weight, but you know, it's pretty light. So it has inertia, but not very much. It's pretty light. And it's sitting here, it's at rest, it wants to stay at rest, and I'm going to exert a small force on our wagon and we'll see what happens. So a small force can create a big change in motion because the wagon doesn't have very much inertia to resist that change in motion. But what I want to do now is increase the inertia of this wagon, maybe by adding some kind of a massive object to the wagon. <laughs> Safety first at the physics show. <laughs> now, there's a lot of inertia here. I'm going to exert that same small force, and let's see what happens. Not much, right? That's the idea of inertia. In order to get this wagon to have the same change in motion with more inertia, it would take a much bigger force. 
The inertia resists that change. Now we're going to see another demonstration with inertia. Evan's going to show us something with a hammer and an anvil. Are we having fun? So we just talked about inertia. Now, this is a hammer, and it's commonly used to drive nails into wood. Compared to a nail, a hammer is huge and heavy, and most important of all, it has a lot of inertia. When the hammer strikes the nail, it, uh, the hammer wants to keep moving forward, driving the nail into the wood. But I obviously didn't bring any nails today, so we'll have to use my hands. Ready? Oh, not in front of the kids, right? <laughs> well, it would really, really hurt, right? But let's put something with a little bit more inertia than the hammer, like this anvil. And so when the hammer strikes the anvil, the anvil uh, is going to resist movement because it has way more inertia than the hammer. So, my hand's safe. Thank you. So we've been learning about inertia. If you're made out of stuff, if you've got mass, you've got inertia. So if you start off at rest, you want to stay at rest. Now, at this fancy Italian restaurant we have here, we've got a lot of stuff that's got inertia. So forks and plates that've got inertia, water glasses, inertia, and if you're fancy enough for a tablecloth, you should always have a candle, and candles have inertia. So all of those are at rest. They're going to want to stay at rest. But Frank, he's going to make that tablecloth move. Can you count this down with me? Three. Two, one. That was pretty amazing. Kids, should you try that at home? Yeah. Grown ups, should they try that at home? Yeah. The correct answer to both of those questions is yes, but first we're going to listen to Frank tell us how to do this. Yeah, I guarantee the first few times you do that, maybe more than that, whatever you're using is going to go flying onto the floor. So um, you want to use uh, something like a little block of wood. Block of wood works really well, and if that falls on the floor, it's not a problem. Or a book. Books work pretty well, too. I don't know if you can see that, but if your book is about Galileo, it works really well. <laughs> Eggs have mass. That means eggs have inertia, so they, if they start at rest, they want to stay at rest. Frank is carefully balancing a pie plate and cardboard tube, and now he's got that egg. It, it wants to stay at rest, but Frank might have other plans. <laughs> what you got there, Frank? I've got a broomstick. What you got to do with that broomstick, Frank? I'm going to whack that pie plate. That sounds like something else we could count down. Three, two, one. You understand what I'm doing here, right? <laughs> I'm going to whack that pipe. It's going to go flying toward David, and we're going to keep our eye on the egg. Let's try that again. Three, two, one. <laughs> Kids, should you try that at home? Yeah. Frank, do you have any advice? I do. You don't have to get fancy with pie plates and eggs. You, all you need is a little piece of cardboard and a coin, and you can flick it out of the way like that with your finger, like the graphic shows, or use a pencil. It's the same demonstration. If you really want to use the pie plate, you don't have to use an egg. Any, uh, any small ball, like a bowling ball, will be fine. Frank, Frank, that's a golf ball. That's <laughs> a bowling ball. <laughs> a golf ball. A bowling ball. You couldn't use a bowling ball. A bowling ball would be crazy. That's crazy. Nobody would use a bowling ball. Or could they? This is certainly not a golf ball. Um, you understand the physics behind what I'm about to do? This is just the supersized version of what Frank and David did over there. I got my egg. This here is my pie plate, and the foam in here is going to represent the water. I'm going to 
yanked this thing towards me, and we'll see what the bowling ball does. Can you count down with me? Three, two, We're going to do uh, another little demonstration about inertia. I've got a uh, bowling ball here, and it's gonna, I'm going to hang it from a string. We're going to put another string underneath. If we just had a handsome physics instructor, we could finish this demonstration. <laughs> well, we'll do the best we can. So uh, I'm going to ask you a little question here. I'm going to push down on this lower string, push down right here. And you're going to tell me which string breaks first. OK? So if you think the upper string breaks first, give it a round of applause. If you think the lower string breaks first, give it a round of applause. If you think I'm going to break the opposite of whatever you just said, give me a round of applause. Yeah, you're getting to know me a little bit. OK, so here it goes. You ready? Three, two, one. The upper, the upper string broke, but you know what I like to do? I like to repeat an experiment. 